Welcome back to Reimagine 2021. I'm Yona Hockhauser, and today I'm honored to be joined by Pamela Clegg, Director of Financial Investigations and Education at CypherTrace. Pamela, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Now, Pamela, uh, it's an honor to speak to you. We spoke a little bit before we started kind of about what your background is. Do you want to give a, like, a quick summary of what your background is and how you got into blockchain? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I was a diplomat for over 10 years with the U.S. government, um, did a lot of work, counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism type work, um, did that for over a decade. And it was just a natural transition into anti-money laundering from mm -hmm. following those trends. You know, what can I take from the public sector and really apply this into the private sector? Um, so that was a really natural transition into banking, uh, working in the AML space in the banking industry. I worked for a large community bank here in Texas, where I really kind of got my start, got my CAMS, my, my certified um, anti-money laundering specialist certification, um, and really delved into the world of anti-money laundering. Um, and then, you know, I heard about this crypto stuff, right? We'd all kind of heard about this, you know, back in 2014, 2015, when it really kind of started to get popular. And it really just piqued my interest. And, and I really saw it as the wave of the future. Um, you know, I, I personally thought it was ridiculous that I could send an international wire transfer and it takes three days to get there. Um, when I could jump on an airplane and fly the money over, you know, in one day. Um, and then this magic of crypto that everything happens, you know, with, you know, Bitcoin basically being the slowest of all cryptos and that's still 10 minutes, right, yeah. um, for this transfer to go anywhere around the world. And uh, so I, um, you know, met up with CypherTrace and, and the work completely enthralled me. Um, and as I mentioned, I have not been bored a day in my in my life since I've joined CypherTrace and that was over two years ago. Um, crypto just moves at a breakneck speed and it's um, it's exciting, um, but it's also a lot of work just to keep up with, you know, current events and, and the current technologies out there. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, for sure, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, the financial crimes or really any crime, there's always this game of, uh, of cops and robbers where, you know, the, the criminals get one step ahead and then the, then the, the you know, the, the authorities get one step ahead and the criminals. Um, and, and I think we're seeing this again, you know, obviously with the sure. crypto space, um, you know, and obviously, you know, be know, know better than most. And I think the, for, there was a period of time, I think crypto started off, no one really knew about it. Bitcoin started off, you know, it was a very small sector. Um, and then it started to gain uh, kind of a following. Mm -hmm. And it, one of its big first real world use cases um, was in the dark net. You know, the, 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 sure. if we want to be honest here, if we want to be honest about, about wh where we are today, we have to be honest about where we came from. Um, and so the technology was made neutral. The technology was made available for anyone to use, but one of the, you know, seemingly the first real use cases for it was, was the dark net, um, the dark web, Silk Road, all these things. Um, but but that's, that's really been a while ago. But I feel like in the mainstream for a long time, this, this kind of uh, negative connotation, this kind of malicious connotation of Bitcoin being this criminal money um, has really stuck in the minds of a lot of the mainstream and especially in the minds of the government. Yeah. Um, it, does that still hold true today? Is, is it warranted? Is Bitcoin and crypto overall still really, in essence, a criminal money? I, I mean, look, as far as, you know, we're doing this interview today, right? So Janet Yellen spoke, and I'm sure that's part of what you're referencing um, in her, you know, confirmation hearing. And she referenced crypto as being used for mostly illicit activity. Um, and the, there's tons of statistics to debunk that. Um, you know, CypherTrace has their own report. I've seen, you know, obviously our competitors have similar, uh, you know, stats and data out there as well. When we look at money laundering as a trend, like as an, as an overall stat, which is difficult to do, right? It's difficult to put mm -hmm. an actual figure on the amount of money that's laundered a year. Um, the, st the statistic that I generally use generally comes from the U.S. Department of State, which sometimes, you know, ranges between 1.5 to two and a half trillion, Okay, so we're talking about trillions of dollars, yeah. right? Wow. That's being laundered. We look at enforcement actions against banks, right? Traditional financial institutions against banks. Um, the most recent one, Capital One, right? Just had a huge enforcement action levied against it. And when you look at those numbers and you compare them to the amount of funds that are actually illicit funds in cryptocurrency, I mean, it pales in comparison, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
uh, the statistics can range. And again, it's hard to put exact numbers, but for the amount of money that's laundered using cryptocurrency out of that two, two and a half trillion dollars, we're still talking like single digit percentage points, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about single digits. So um, is it warranted somewhat? Yes. I mean, let's all, we can all, you know, admit to the fact that Silk Road was really kind of the, the burgeoning of cryptocurrency, you know, that's um, really kind of Bitcoin really kind of got its unfortunate start. Um, and we can all hark back to the time when, you know, Mt. Gox and, and, the, and the huge numbers that were hacked out of, out of Mt. Gox. But, you know, one of the things that I feel like I've really become an advocate for, look, and I look at the bad side of crypto every day, right? I'm doing investigations in crypto every single day. And one of the things that I feel like it's, uh, imperative and it's um, incumbent upon me to be the advocate for is there's so much transparency in cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. right? I would much rather investigate a transaction that occurred in Bitcoin or Ethereum or, you know, RSK, whatever, than investigate a cash transaction any day. Um, the biggest thing that I point out, and you know, this is whether it's expert testimony or whether I'm working with law enforcement or whether I'm working with banks who are just scared and completely, um, you know, cowering to to this to this concept of cryptocurrency is, look, guys, if a cash transaction takes place in a dark alley between two people, you have two witnesses to that transaction. If a Bitcoin transaction takes place, you have the whole world as a witness to that transaction. Now we have the whole pseudonymous nature and we got to figure out and we actually have to, you know, figure out, did you actually control the private key of this address of the transaction, all that other kind of good stuff. But the fact that that transaction took place doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it creates this, you know, this ability to trace beyond just that transaction um, where if I do a wire transfer from HSBC to Wells Fargo, you know, Wells Fargo only knows about the providence of that money from HSBC. They don't know that that money was actually deposited into HSBC by a drug cartel, you know, money launderer out of, you know, Guadalajara, right? So with crypto, we get that beyond that one, pre that one providence hop, right? We can go beyond that. Um, so I feel like in banking, you, you have to have this trust. I have to trust that these funds coming from HSBC are legitimate. And I'm using HSBC and Wells Fargo as, as just off the top examples. Um, mm. But, you know, crypto just, the transparency just astounds. It's, it's astonishing, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that, that anyone who, who like lives or, or, you know, in the world of crypto understands this, you know, uh, uh, he, he understands that, that that's the kind of the whole point of the, of, of the game is that it is a trustless system. And part of that uh, is this ability that, that it's public. Uh, if you're on a public blockchain, all these transactions are public. So at, at this point, it, are the, the regulators, um, you know, the government agencies and the regulators that actually are affecting regulation, that actually are, are um, you know, affecting uh, enforcement. Are they starting to recognize this? You know, it, it, are they just turning a blind eye and they're, they're like, no, I don't want to hear about it. Is this criminal? Are they slowly learning about it and saying, wait, you know, we like this. Like, if you're going to do criminal activity, make sure to do it on the blockchain. Right. Um, the, the short answer to that is some yes, right? Okay. We have definitely seen regulators and this includes both in the United States and abroad, in the EU, um, in uh, you know the Asia, Asia, uh, Asia Pacific area. We've definitely seen regulators that have understood the advantages of cryptocurrency in the same nature that you just described it, right? Like I would prefer you pay in Bitcoin than <laughs> you know than to pay in something else. Um, so we've definitely seen some positive movement from regulators. I mean, we've seen some really positive announcements and um, regulation come out of the OCC as far as banks actually being able to custody crypto, right? And so we've seen that, um, those advancements. We have seen regulation even throughout the Americas. Um, what I pointed out um, in, in a webinar a couple of weeks ago, Mexico has really pretty decent crypto regulation, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, was act it actually proved fruitful in a case here recently um, where they actually discovered cartels laundering funds using cryptocurrency. And it was because of the reporting requirements that the exchanges have in Mexico that they were able to pick up on this trend, right? And actually identify that. Um, so when we look at overall KYC, for example, who does KYC, know your customer, um, you know, Mexico, the regulations are, 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 are 
pretty tight in Mexico and the exchanges do KYC. And so they have that information available to provide to the authorities. Um, so it's it always amazes me where we see regulation popping up and it's not always in the places that we would expect it. Um, the most recent uh, notice of proposed rulemaking by FinCEN, uh, this, this, this NPR uh, notice pros rulemaking uh, NPRM for for unhosted wallets, right? That kind of got everybody up in a tizzy right before Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that they other other forces prevailed and 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 took you know precedence over that um, particular proposed rulemaking. Um, but you know, the community really did rally together and push back and say, "Hey, listen, these are some of the other." Um, uh, you know, unintended consequences of this rule, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you know, obviously the enforcement of it and and, and the actual logistical piece to it, um, which I'll be quite honest, FinCEN uh, doesn't really care about logistics. They expect you to solve it, right? Um, right. Rightfully so. And sometimes, you know, when when um, the, the UBO, the ultimate beneficial ownership came out, you know, FinCEN was like, figure it out, banks. Like, you can figure <laughs> it out. Um, and, and that was kind of it. And they went ahead with the with the new regulation. Um, but, you know, we did see the community kind of gather together and push back and and outside of FinCEN, we've seen other regulators take notice of that as well. And so I really think um, with the exception of the that that proposed rulemaking that we just saw kind of try to get rushed through by FinCEN, we've seen some really methodical um, measured approaches. Right, and this includes out of the you know the the European Central Bank. Um, we've seen uh, you know regulation really be thoughtful um, in like as I mentioned some Latin American countries in Asia. We've seen some real thoughtful regulation come forth, um, and I feel like that's the best approach. You know, approach it like FATF. Um, FATF engages with us. FATF engages mm -hmm. with other members in the crypto community because they recognize. Look. I mean, I just told you it's a full time job to keep up with crypto technology, right? I can't imagine being a regulator and keeping up with all of my regulatory requirements and keeping up with the crypto, you know, landscape as well. So the, the regulators that bring in the experts that bring in people from the community, I think, are the ones that really put forth um, the best measured uh, regulation that quite frankly, you know, we need regulation, right? We have to have regulation. Everybody is so anti KYC until their crypto gets stolen. Right. And right. then they want the, well, why doesn't that exchange have KYC where my, where my stolen crypto went? And it's like, oh, you know, so we need regulation. It has to go hand in hand with the technology, right? We have to walk together. Um, and so that's really where I think the regulators that excel do that is that they, they go hand in hand with the community and, and put forth thoughtful and um, really useful regulation. Mm -hmm. And for sure, I mean, I, I, you know, as much, uh, you know, as much, uh, you know, shit we give to the regulators, I do not envy their job because, especially in an industry that innovates so quickly. I mean, if you're a regulator, you know, you're, you are, you're, you're educated, you, you know, the traditional financial system, and it's a tough job regulating that traditional financial system, and then all of a sudden, this whole new thing pops up, where this, all right, I, now I learned blockchain. Okay, now I learned Bitcoin. I finally get Bitcoin. Now they tell me this whole Ethereum thing. Okay, now I finally get Ethereum. Now this whole DeFi thing. Now Wait, there's what? DeFi. What are we going to do with DeFi? I know, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, I, I don't envy the, the role of the, edu the, of the right. regulators, but, um, but I mean, that is really good. I mean, there definitely is this need for the regulators in the community to talk, um, uh, to really communicate, because this is where they can find each other's needs. Because at the end of the day, we both want the same thing. Sure. We, we don't want crime, you know, we, 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 everyone kind of wants to be nice, play by the rules um, uh, and, and be free to innovate. Sure. Um, and uh, do you feel that, that today, um, you know, uh, uh, no, it's already yesterday. Yesterday, President Biden uh, was, was uh, inaugurated in, into, in the, into office. Um, and, and, and one of those things he did was, uh, you know, the FinCEN, I don't know how much of the direct hand he had there, but the, the FinCEN proposal was, was uh, shelved for the time being. But one of the things he did was he actually appointed Gary Kinsler, uh, I believe it's the head of the SEC. Yep, um, who, who he's he's he he knows the blockchain. I'm pretty sure he teaches blockchain at MIT. He um, does. I've taken his course. Yeah. Really, you <laughs> took his course at MIT. I took one of the distance learning courses, one of the MIT courses. Yeah, yeah, he teaches it. You know, um, uh, he and uh, Professor Narula. I mean, they 
this is, you know, they understand, they actually understand the technology behind it, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that, yes, he's been, um, you know, we're looking at him to take over, you know, and run the SEC. Look, in all honesty, the SEC has come light years as far as really understanding the technology. Um, I feel like they really had to get on board quickly during the ICO boom because that's their area of, of yeah, domain. Yeah. Um, and they really, for the most part, they jumped in, you know, feet first into the into the entire ecosystem and really understood the technology. Look, CypherTrace does a lot of work with the SEC. Um, so it's not just because I'm biased because, you know, we're we're working with them on on, you know, different investigations and whatnot. But I really feel like if if there's an agency that understands the technology, you know, the SEC is definitely in the top. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you obviously have the IRS CI, right? IRS criminal investigations. They're, you know, light years ahead of people with the, the work and the investigations that they've been doing. HSI does amazing work. FBI does amazing work. DEA has their own cases that they've been, you know, jumping into. So we're really seeing this advancement in law enforcement. And with the regulators, like I said, you know, SEC, we've got amazing things going with CFTC. They're coming on board and they're starting to really understand on the technology and how best to, you know, right. I mean, the, the CFTC was the one that brought the enforcement action against BitMEX, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah. was, that, that takes guts is the word I'll use. I would use another word, but you know, that takes guts to, to go after the behemoth, you know, BitMEX routinely was the largest as far as trading volume, right? Is BitMEX. Um, and, and, for them to kind of jump in and, you know, don't go, they didn't go after the small fish first, right? They went after right. the big fish and, and kind of took that on. So we're seeing them, you know, really kind of come up to speed on everything. Um, and then, like I said, yeah, OCC, um, FDIC, I mean, we have, we have a working relationship with the FDIC. They've really got some great um, people that are really understanding. And, and I think a lot of it, um, to be honest, it's, it's, it's less of an institutional focus um, mm -hmm. at those particular regulators and law enforcement. And it's really almost like a personal thing. You know, you get like a couple of investigators who are like, by golly, I'm going to figure this out. Like I want to, this is the, like kind of the way that I got in here. This is the wave of the future. I'm getting in on this. I want to be in it now. I want to understand how it works. I want to understand how to investigate it and I'm going to do it. And then that's kind of infectious, right? Within mm -hmm. their groups. Um, so it, it, it's exciting to have, you know, Gary Gensler come in. Um, he has been very clear uh, in his course, in the particular course that I took, that he does, um, he, he has made statements about wanting some addi additional protection for investors as far as market manipulation, you know, in inflated volumes, things like that. Um, I, I don't really get into the whole trading aspect of crypto, right? I'm more into the nitty gritty details. Um, so that's obviously for, for bigger, brighter minds um, to weigh in on. So I, I think he will bring some, some regulatory changes, um, but it, yeah, it's, it's definitely refreshing to have somebody in that understands the technology without a doubt. Um, that, that was a very exciting nomination um, and, and the industry is, is kind of a buzz about it, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, so I'm excited that the SEC is getting it. Um, I hope that the IRS takes as long as possible to figure out blockchain because once they realize that, wait, if we just put all the money on the blockchain, then literally no one could ever hide any taxes ever again. We have all the records. So, IRS, take your time. SEC, good job. Um, but yeah, listen, it, you know, as as this technology develops and and and, and obviously because it's so new, uh, you know, the there's not that many people brought up on it, but as the time goes on and more people are, you know, today's traders are tomorrow's regulators, you know, to, today's students, uh, uh, you know, who are in hobbyists are tomorrow's rulers. So, uh, you know, as the time goes on, I think this conversation will, you know, will, will, won't even exist because it'll be so par for the course. Um, but, you know, I, there's something interesting about, about this new reality we live in of digital assets um, that ties in with digital crimes. You know, crimes used to be much more geographically based. You know, crimes, was it taking, did it happen in over state lines? Was it a federal thing? Um, they used to be much more geographically based, but now in this world where, you know, borders don't really matter in the software world, um, you know, to these crimes, uh, we, we see that, like you mentioned with the CFTC going after a, um, a BitMEX. 
Yes, they, uh, you know, they, they the, essentially they were, U, I believe it's two out of three or three out of four founders were U.S. citizens. Um, they, they, were, they were not, what does that mean? Were they located in America? Uh, the U.S. customers were not allowed to utilize the platform, but with a Correct. VPN, you Correct. could use anything. So, right. I mean, in, to, in today's reality, um, and, and by the way, in response to the CFTC actually going after, uh, and also the SEC going after a number of other ICO late ICO thing, Salt Enigma, um, some in the crypto community uh, were saying, hey, regulators are being too harsh on us. If you're not going to create a nice environment for us, we're going to leave the US. Sure. Ripple, right? Right, exactly. Ripple, uh, there's a Brad Garlinghouse who said so. But in today's world where you know, location doesn't really matter, now it's merely jurisdictions. Right. Um, you know, how, how do we police the world you know, in terms of jurisdictions? If, if, uh, if, a, if, an, uh, if an exchange is regulated in Malta, the offices are in Shanghai and the users in the US, what does that mean jurisdiction today? Right, that's, I mean, that's a really great point, right? If there's anything I think that the pandemic has taught us is that there are no such thing as borders anymore, right? Um, if, if there's an infection anywhere in the world, then there's an infection in the world, right? Um, same thing with crypto, you know, crypto flies across borders. Crypto doesn't even know that borders exist, right? That mm -hmm. just doesn't, it's not, it's not anything that, that is recognized within crypto and rightfully so. I mean, that's one of the points, you know, I, I, I joke about sending an international wire transfer, right? But the economy is global. Our world, you know, this is how we all survive. This is how you and I are talking from, you know, across the ocean, right? This is normal. I pick up the phone and I FaceTime somebody and they're wherever they are in the world, right? Um, so this is an interesting question because I just had a conversation yesterday with another investigator um, and we were kind of collaborating on a case. And one of the issues that we come up against a lot when, when talking about digital crime, that digital crime has no borders. Um, and, and most cyber crime relies on cryptocurrency, right? Mm -hmm. For its method of payment um, and, and understandably so. And we're talking about, you know, there's just so much cyber crime, whether it's a, a scam, whether it's a fish, um, we've seen such an increase in phishing, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's the MetaMask fish that we worked, we can talk about um, that case in a little bit, but you know, the blockchain, I've seen people's blockchain wallets be fished, um, here in the ledger, right? Breach, yeah. I mean, it's, we've just seen so much an increase, and, and I don't know if it's a, really an actual numerical increase in phishing, or if it's just because they've been more high profile, that we've really picked up more, you know, MetaMask and Ledger. I mean, these are big names, right? Um, and so when we talk about this, you know, those cases, those are big. We're gonna have, you know, victim, you know, uh, damages in the amounts of, you know, over a million, all that kind of stuff. So I can, we can, we can get federal cases, right? The MetaMask case has already been picked up by a huge DA's office. Um, we've got, you know, Ledger stuff that's being picked up by, by federal guys. So it's, um, that that's not an issue, but when we have victims that are losing twenty thousand dollars, thirty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. Like if I lost a hundred thousand dollars, that would that would hurt. That would hurt me, right? You know, we're we're working. We're like working class, right? That would definitely hurt. And the issue that we have, and this is this is the conversation the other investigator was having. He had just gotten off the phone with the local police department um somewhere in the united states and he had spent an hour trying to convince them to take on this case for a hundred thousand dollars wow. and they wouldn't take it why most of the time what i find and what he found as well is that because they already assume that the perpetrators are not going to be located within the united states mm. then they yeah. don't see it coming to a successful end they don't see that they're actually going to be able to, you know, put handcuffs and actually, you know, close the case 100%. Now, there's a lot that can happen without actually, you know, criminal charges and actually arresting. I mean, number one, we could actually go to the exchange and maybe get some of those funds back for the victim, right? And that's where we need law enforcement to come out. You know, most exchanges are willing to work with us when there's a victim, you know, hey, this, here's proof we did the trace here, the funds ended up at this account. They'll actually go in, they'll look at the account and they'll be like, oh yeah, you know what? This account's kind of suspicious and they'll freeze the funds and, and they'll wait for a judicial order or they'll wait for a court order, whatever it is so that they can return those funds. Most exchanges, just like we said, 
or you said it best, you know, we don't want crypto to be used for only bad, right? It behooves everyone in the crypto community for this to be used for good, right? For this to be legitimate, for this to be, uh, um, you know, um, seen more positively than negatively, right? And the exchanges understand that, right? So even exchanges, and here's where we get back to our jurisdictional question, right? Even exchanges that don't fall within the jurisdiction of the United States will respond to US law enforcement or will respond to European law enforcement or will respond to you know some other country's law enforcement because again it behooves them to do this. Now there are definitely some exchanges that don't and we you know um we we all kind of know who they are right um but it's definitely it's definitely not as bleak as I think some people paint it. Mm -hmm. um, there's you know, communication behind the scenes between these exchanges and their compliance officers. They communicate quite frequently, um, you know, talk about blacklisting addresses, uh, you know, actually working together. I mean, we even saw Binance did their own investigation into some funds, right? Like, yeah. you know, having that actually come out of an exchange was quite refreshing. Um, and so they very much understand this. They're very much in most cases willing to work um, you know, there are the outliers, you know, the exchanges that are more like the BTCEs uh, of, of the past, right, that were very well known for really kind of going after the criminal activity and, and, and kind of promoting that criminal activity and, and assisting with that. Um, but most exchanges aren't that way. So when it comes to that jurisdictional issue, um, I see the, the compliance as not really being so much of, a, of an issue. Um, what I do see trending a little bit more is, you know, we saw this with Binance, we saw this with Hobie for a while, we've seen this with other exchanges. Um, you know, if I'm big Binance, understandably so, I don't necessarily want my entire exchange to follow U.S. regulations. So I'm going to create Binance.us. Binance.us. Exactly. And Binance.us is going to service the U.S. person and then they're actually, that's the entity that is actually going to comply with U.S. regulation. Um, I, that's a trend that we see, and I, I expect that to continue. Um, we see that, you know, Hobie has tons of different, you know, branches of Hobie. You know, there's not just one Hobie out there, right? Um, so I, I expect that to continue. I think that's one way for them to combat, um, you know, because it would, it would be impossible to follow every country's regulation mm -hmm. if you were an entity, right? It would just be impossible to know, what am I supposed to do for Korea? What am I supposed to do for the United States? What am I supposed to do in, you know, Japan and Mexico and it's, it, it's too much, it's overwhelming. Um, now, then we kind of get into DeFi, right? Where that kind of goes away because you don't have a central authority um, or decentralized exchanges. You don't have a central authority that has now, to- also, also a lot of time anonymous teams. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, you've got, you know, we tried to, we, CypherTrace did this big KYC report um, and, it, you know, it's on our website, it's free. Anybody can go and grab it, read it. Um, and, you know, in, in finding the jurisdictions for these exchanges, that was half the battle. You know, that's half the battle right there is, okay, well, this exchange, does this exchange technically belong in Cyprus or is it really actually operating out of Singapore, right? Like trying to figure out where, where these exchanges actually, you know, have to respond to. Um, but even within that, there were numerous exchanges that just have no location, geographic location. Right. So if you have no, because what is it? it? It could be a dude in his mom's basement there. And, his, and that's the CEO and the, the guy coding is uh, sitting in Sweden. Uh, yeah. cafe. Or it could be all open source. Right. right? Like, right. Um, you know, it's it, so, you know, and I think that was one of the great points that I actually saw come out of um, one of the, one of the points against the notice proposed rulemaking. Right. Was when you're you're expecting us to provide, you know, KYC customer information on addresses. Well, an address could be a smart contract, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's not always a natural person or natural right. entity. Um, and so, you know, we definitely have this. So I think that is one of the concepts that is the hardest for regulators to wrap their heads around um, mm -hmm. because everything has always, traditional finance is still geographically contained, right? Yeah. Um, if I'm sending, you know, we even think about the way you send a wire, domestic and international wires, right? It's it's right. so geographically contained in the way that that traditional finance operates. And so I think that is going to be the biggest challenge for regulators is understanding 
that jurisdictional dilemma for them. But then on the flip side of that, and this is what, when I train exchanges, I make this very clear, exchanges, vast virtual asset service providers, whatever they are. Look, don't think that because you don't step foot in the United States that the United States isn't gonna come after you, right? We saw this with BitMEX. We saw this with BTCE, right? If you offer services to a US person, then they can come after you. So, you know, this is just something, if, if you are a virtual asset service provider outside the United States, it's something that you really got to think hard about, right? And really understand and really make sure, you know, look at BitMEX, right? VPNs. Now, in all honesty, was BitMEX maybe assisting their US persons with working their way around that, right? Uh, you know, that's that's really what got them in trouble, right? But, um, but it's definitely something as a VASP, um, to take into consideration and not just the US, you know, what other regulatory jurisdictions would come after me if I offered right. services to their customers as well, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, listen, in the, like you mentioned, this idea of jurisdictions and then and even for the exchanges, you know, especially with the, these behemoths you mentioned, they don't want to, you know, like a Binance, they don't want that their whole Binance has to uh, adhere to the US regulation, rightly so. So uh, when it comes out that, that Binance US, you know, is essentially Binance is subsidiary to shell company, whatever you want to call it, um, in the eyes of regulators, you know, um, aren't they essentially, isn't that fine when they rather, you know, just like, hey, it, it, I, either our citizens could, you know, go use a VPN, go the back door and either use your not your, you know, your exchange that's outside of jurisdiction right. or, hey, you're going to make this shell thing, you'll put on this whole show and game, but at least now our users are interacting with a, with a regulated uh, exchange. And I think too, it gives you that avenue of communication to the parent company, right? Yeah. If if all else fails, you know, we'll go through that that you know, Hobie Hobie US didn't last very long. No, and I think no. that was part I think that was partly why. I think the yeah, minute right. they opened their doors, they were flooded with subpoenas from here in the United States because historically, you know, we haven't been able um to work in most cases there there have been cases where Hobie has been cooperative. Um, so I, I don't want to throw them under the bus in any way, but I, th I think what happened when they opened their doors was, oh my gosh, great. We have a <laughs> presence in the United States and we have all these, you know, pending cases where the money ended up there. Let's, you know, let's go after them. And I think it was just too much to, to bear and, and handle. For sure. Um, and then, all right, you, you, know, you brought up DeFi. Mm, yeah. Now, um, <laughs> listen, okay. So if, if you were to go to the average person today, you know, there's a pretty good chance the average person have, has heard of Bitcoin and uh, maybe Ethereum, maybe not. All right. Probably less than Bitcoin, but still DeFi is not really, has not really hit the zeitgeist and not really mainstream yet. Right. How about on the regulators end? How are, does the government agencies, the regulators, how aware are they of DeFi? Um, how, how good is their understanding of DeFi and how worried about DeFi are they? They should be worried. Um, and I say that because I'm worried about DeFi. Okay. Look, I love the concept. The concept's amazing, right? I mean, right. it's as with anything in the early stages, it can be abused, right? You know, we talked about Bitcoin being abused in the beginning. We the internet was abused in the beginning, right? Like mm -hmm. DeFi has amazing potential. It already has proven, I think it's potential in a lot of ways, um, but I've already seen the more sophisticated criminals use DeFi um, as, you know, you, you, we go back to that, you know, cat and mouse game with the criminals, right? Yep. They started jumping on the DeFi wagon, you know, pretty soon. And it was just another layer of obfuscation, you know, all of the, you know, going cross chain and all of these different layering attempts and swapping in and out of currencies. <clears throat> I mean, that's, DeFi facilitates that for them. Um, yep. So we've definitely seen this, the MetaMask case, right? Mm -hmm. The MetaMask um, uh, phishing uh, victims, their funds were moved through DeFi, right? They were swapped in and out. They were put into wrapped Bitcoin. They were, you know, brought around. They were put into, um, you know, different types of currencies. Some of them, and I will say this again, the exchanges, it behooves them to cooperate. We actually had, um, you know, uh, some of the crypto that was used, we actually had the, the administrators of that crypto were willing to help out in that case as well, right? Mm -hmm. Crypto, um, you know, 
administrator, I want to call them administrators or kind of the creators or, you know, because there's just so many different ways to actually to actually build a, a crypto and to build a blockchain. But, um, you know, it's the same thing. It behooves them to not become known as the, you know, crypto of, of illicit actors, right? Right. Um, but we, we saw them use DeFi. And this is a trend that we are continuing to see. Um, and another case, an investigator I was talking to yesterday, same thing, moving in and out of DeFi, right? So um, they should be worried. Do they understand it? No. Does the average person even know what DeFi is? No, absolutely not. Um, does anybody understand DeFi? Right. I think that sometimes is 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 a uh, it can be a varied answer. Like we all have our varying levels of understanding of DeFi in and of itself, right? Within the industry. Um, so I think that that's going to definitely be on the agenda for regulators in 2021. Um, it's already on our agenda. As I said, we've already had multiple cases with it. Um, and again, like I said, it's I think DeFi is amazing. I think there's so much potential there. It's just like with anything else, you know, DEXs when they first, you know, right, you know, we saw DEXs being used nonstop, right, for right. criminal activity. Um, and, you know, then the, the other thing that's kind of interesting, you know, Shapeshift, what did Shapeshift announce? You know, what was it, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, right? They're moving to a decentralized format. Why? Because they're going to do away with KYC. Right. That's so, right. Hey, we're not in control of it. Well, no, no, you can't. Don't yell at us. That's right. You know, so you take away that centralized authority, and then all of this other stuff. So, how does that become regulated? Mm -hmm. How can you regulate something that's decentralized? Only the on ramps and off ramps. That's exactly. uh, it's the only thing you control. The the I will say this. The nice thing about DeFi, and and the decentralized any and a decentralized exchange is that. With centralized exchanges, you know, historically we can't trace through them, right? Mm -hmm, right. Goes into an exchange, stop. You put up stop sign. You got to reach out to that exchange and find out what happened. Even if they, you know, even if they pump the funds into, I'll stop picking on, you know, Binance. Even if they pump the funds into Kraken and swapped, yeah. you know, Bitcoin to Ethereum and then moved the Ethereum off, you still have to go to Kraken to find out that that's right. what happened, right? Because right. it's centralized and it all gets, you know, into the omnibus accounts and, and hot wallets and all that kind of good stuff. With decentralized, we can at least in most cases trace through that, right? right. So um, you would just have to understand that there was probably a change in ownership, right? So you've got, you've got to understand the concept. You can still trace that coin, but it's not controlled by the same. So now, you know, what did they swap it for? Okay, then they swapped it for here. You know, then they moved here. So it's, it really, um, it's a challenge. It's an exciting challenge. A lot of times, you know, kind of, I'll be honest, sometimes you kind of get like, you know, the little clicking tracing Bitcoin, you're kind of like, oh, okay, great. You know, oh, wow, yeah. real inventive. They went three hops and put it in exchange. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's exciting. Um, I, I think it's going to be uh, a challenge for us, but it's definitely going to be a challenge for, for regulators. You know, how, how do you regulate decentralized um, anything, finance right. exchanges, yeah. yeah. Right, so I mean, so far we focused on you know, the law enforcement side, the regulator side of things. And I wanna look more on the user side of things. Um, you know, uh, historically there's kind, of, there's kind of two ways that kind of malicious activity for the most part happens with crypto due to its nature. Either someone's doing a malicious act and wants to be paid in Bitcoin Oh, it wants to be paid in crypto uh, because it's not traceable or, or, or because of its unique nature. Um, and the other thing is, um, is stealing uh, uh, digital assets from somebody. So that's historically, you know, if we look back, uh, the longer back we go, it seemed like every day there was an exchange hack. There was a, uh, you know, whether it be an inside job or, or, or you know, a, a lax in security and all these things. Um, and then on the, other, on the other end, you have, you know, malicious activities being paid for, whether it be money laundering, whether it be ransomware attacks, uh, that was huge last year and uh, major U.S. cities were being taken down. Yeah. Uh, so so let, let's break those two down, uh, you know, real quick. Um, on the user's end, um, you know, uh, going back a couple of years, it seemed like no matter what exchange you put it into, your funds were being stolen. Right. Um, and as time has gone on, as these big exchanges have grown, learned better practices, become bigger and higher, better security, you know, all these things, uh, those, those exchange hacks have seemingly gone down less and less. Um, so on a user end, mm -hmm. um, in terms of I have crypto and mm -hmm. I want to 
uh, secure my, my crypto, make sure no one takes, Nick takes it from me. What are some of the biggest threats facing crypto users today? This is so, such an interesting question because this is like an ongoing discussion on our Slack and like on an internal Slack channel, right? Like, you know, the typical response, especially from our engineers, right? Is not your keys, not your crypto, right? And these are like our early Bitcoin guys, you know, like yeah, they've yeah. been doing this forever and they're like, not your keys, not your crypto. And I'm like, uh, not my MetaMask, somebody else's MetaMask just fished my Meta, like, you know, yeah, yeah. and I, so I'm kind of, you know, I mean, I'll be honest, my crypto is at a well-known exchange, mm -hmm. right? And I leave it at the exchange. Why? Because I trust that exchange. And like you said, we have seen such a huge increase in the ability of the exchanges to maintain their security, right? To prevent and work against that. Um, and then the other thing too, is that we've also seen, you know, the hacks that have happened recently. Okay, well, Binance got hacked May, um, it was almost almost two years ago now, you yeah, know? 2019, right? Yeah, 2019, right? 40, it was like $40 million. Did any of their customers lose any money? No, Binance covers that, right? Like mm -hmm. we're now at a point where the exchanges, if, if you're going with the big dog exchanges, right? We're now at a point where if that exchange were to get hacked, like, let's be honest, if Coinbase were to get hacked, like, do I feel like Coinbase would leave me out in the cold? I don't, I don't. Like I have faith as a customer in that exchange. It's not just Coinbase, you know, a Gemini or, or Binance or Bitstamp, any of the big, the, big, the big dog exchanges. I feel like they're not going to make me take the, take the loss, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like there's kind of this debate, you know, sometimes I feel like it's almost more dangerous to have the crypto yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, SIM swaps, how many times that, you know, obviously there's not a cyber person out there that's gonna tell you that it's safe to keep your crypto on a phone naturally, right, right. but how many cases of SIM swaps have I worked where, you know, into the millions Right, that were stolen. By off the way, of the way, uh, they, they, the U.S. mobile uh, operators have to do a way better job. Uh, back, back when I was working at Block TV, may it rest in peace. Um, I actually did a, an investigative report. I, I tried it. I called up T-Mobile, um, and, uh, and my friend just gave me their phone number, and I and I said I pretended to be them. I gave no information. I said I lost my SIM. Send me a new SIM card. They asked for no information. They said, "What's your PIN?" I said, I don't know a pin, uh, one, two, three, four. That's apparently the automatic pin that is assigned to every account. They were willing to, uh, they paid for it. They paid for the shipping. I said, I'm, uh, um, I don't send it to my home address, send it to this other address. Send it here they, instead. Yeah. They paid to send me the stolen SIM card. Hey, I'm on vacation in Miami. Can you send the SIM card here instead? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh... <laughs> Uh, is there it, not regulation? Do, does law enforcement not realize? I mean, that, that there, law enforcement now, works a lot of sim swap cases. You would think. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, it's frustrating. It's frustrating. Talk about me. needing regulation. Regulate those mobile yeah, operators. I know, right? I know. But you know, so you know, sim swaps aside, like nobody's going to tell you that it's safe to keep your crypto on a phone. Um, but you know, people thought it was safe. Their ledgers were safe, right? People thought their MetaMask was saying you had to have MetaMask to do certain trends. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, you know, and this is, this is kind of what scares me sometimes about mass adoption mm -hmm. and central bank digital currencies, right? To me, it's not the technology itself, right? It's the end user. Like, mm -hmm. how do I protect, if we come out with the, with the CBDC, right? How is my mom going to be able to protect and maintain and you know custody her central bank digital currency right how how what does that end user look like what does that education look like do you know you know the you know i live in a small town um, outside of 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 dallas right so more on the on the smaller side um, than dallas and i i'm amazed at how many people in this town will click on a link in their text message Right, because UPS, well, UPS sent me this text message that I have a package coming, and so it must be true. And I'm like, did you have a package coming from UPS? <sighs> and they were like, no. And it's like, well, great. Now your phone's infected, right? Like, yeah. you know, stop clicking yeah. on link. But it happens all the time, right? Um, so that end user, I think, is really 
you know, a lot of these fishes, I mean, these were guys that have been doing crypto. One of the guys that I'm working in case for since 2013, he's like, yeah. I can't believe I got fished. You should know better. He's like, I've been doing this far too long for this to happen to me. Yeah. He's like, I just can't believe it. Right. And so it's like, you know, these criminal, they, they're good. They're good, right? The MetaMask thing, it was, you know, I don't know how many domains they had in their back pocket, but, you know, it was popping up number one on Google. That would get taken down. They had another one ready to roll. Another mm -hmm. one ready to roll, right? Every time it would come down, they'd put another one up, put another one up, put another one up. And so it's like, you know, very sophisticated. Um, so I, you know, I, I just don't know the answer to that. I think it's whatever makes you feel the most comfortable as a yeah. user. Um, I feel the most comfortable leaving my crypto on a well-known exchange. Um, I may not feel that way if maybe I lived in a country where I didn't have, you know, a big dot. I, and also the exchange that I use is within my jurisdiction, right? right? That's another thing that I feel like I could have some legal recourse if it were necessary. Um, but I feel like it's up to each user. I mean, then we have engineers that write that have their private key spliced and it's on like, you know, three or four different places and, and, and all kinds of stuff. And they're like, you're not getting it. Like if you ever, if you get any of my part, you're going to get like, you know, a fourth of it. You're never going to get my whole private key. And I'm like, whoa, you know, which I can understand. Hey, if I had $260 million, like the guy that had, you know, that's in the news right now, if I had $260 million of Bitcoin, I would probably do that too, right? Like yeah. I, I could see, I could see that that level of security being necessary. Um, so yeah, the the exchanges I feel like have come leaps and bounds, um, with the exception of you know the quadrigas, uh, you know, Cryptopia was one that that unfortunately did result in loss for their customers. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I definitely think that we've seen maybe turned a corner, if I can say that without jinxing it. Watch there be a hack, like a huge hack. Like later today. Um, <laughs> right, it was headlines. Binance is down. All funds are gone. <laughs> Pamela Clegg says exchanges won't ever get hacked again. Binance down. Um, uh, but yeah, I feel like we've turned a corner and I feel like, you know, customers ask all the time, what's the safest way to keep my crypto? Well, you know, it really and truly has to do with your own abilities. Right. Like, I am not capable because I'm not a computer engineer to, you know, build my own devices or, you know, create what like, it's, it's just not going to happen. Like I'm comfortable with what I do. Um, I just, everybody else should be comfortable, you know, do it to the best of your abilities. If you're capable of running, um, you know, a, a special type of wallet or you're capable of, of splicing or you're capable of, you know, whatever it is, a, a virtual machine, and having all your stuff wherever and then then do it, you know, mm -hmm. um, having a brain, you know, brain wallet, whatever it is, right? It's, yeah. that's that's not what I'm comfortable with. So that's not what I do. Uh -huh. Right, listen, for the people who have the money exchanges, uh, you know, they're warned, uh, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. And, and for right. people who hold your crypto, I warn them, uh, think before you click that link. So yep. uh, listen, I, there's attack vector, there's attack vectors uh, in, in all directions, no matter what. Uh, the best thing factors. is just, Set up two factor, you know, like, because look, a SIM swap isn't just about the wallet. It's not just about the bread wallet on my phone, right? It's about right. the fact that I have a Coinbase app and right. you can get into my Coinbase account with, with the SIM swap as well. Have two factor, right? That's, that's the and, one. And, thing and, and go, I got, a, I got like five authenticator apps that authenticate my other apps. And exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. There you, you go. Be, Redundant. I actually, <laughs> I actually just memorized my private key. It's not Renner. It's memorized. I manually input it everywhere. Um, and then, and then I literally just wipe my brain afterwards to make sure it's not stolen. Yeah. Like uh, the guy, so you've seen the, you've seen the, um, the news about the guy with the 260 million, right? Um, he, the, forgot, he, for, he, he forgot his, uh, he forgot his, uh, his login or whatever. Yeah. So what's, what's really interesting about that is that the device that it's on is this iron key, right? And Dave yeah. and Dave invented the iron key. Like that was really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Dave and Steve, they, and, and JJ, they all worked Iron Key before. And so they don't have that back door? Why don't they have, they have that convenient no, back door I, they built in? That was the huge sell of Iron Key is that there was no back door. Like oh, no. the encryption, right? It is like entirely secure. Um, and so, you know, now here's this guy, he's got 260 million, you know, that private keys on that Iron Key. And um, he's done his eight out of 10 attempts. Yeah. And he's just like, I really just don't. He's like, I have so no clue wild. what it could even be. And uh, right. and but you know, I 
look, it's in, in all fairness, it's, it's 15 year old technology, right? Yeah. And if I were him, I would say, listen, you know, put it up for right. You know, quantum, anybody that's great at quantum, whatever is, Hey, I'll split yeah. it with you. Like go right. grab you a bunch of other iron keys, see if you can break the encryption, like go out and, and try to yeah. do it. And then you come in and if, if you can get into it, yeah, I'll split it. Right. Yeah. I mean, cause you still walk away with 130 million. I'll take it. You know, yeah, by the way, 100, 130 million today, who knows what tomorrow's who price knows of what it'll be worth tomorrow. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, that's that's just an example of your boss, Dave Jevons, being too good at his job. Uh, you know, <laughs> if only he was a little less smart, a little less capable. If uh, only he were less smart, darn it. Right. Well, uh, Pamela, thank you so much for joining us. This is all the time we have. But as a pleasure, I mean, I, I love talking to people at CypherTrace. I don't know what it is with your company. You guys have such awesome workers. You are as well, Pamela. So thank you so much for letting us know what's going on behind the scenes, what's going on with the regulators, as well as what's going on in the space. Uh, it's very exciting. I look forward to speaking to you again sometime, and I know our viewers do as well. So thank you very much for taking the time. And for all our viewers here at Reimagine 2021, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.